Okay, so in this episode on quantum computing, I'll be talking about quantum algorithms. This will use a lot of the concepts from my video on quantum bits. So if you haven't seen it yet, you absolutely should. One of the things we learned there is that a quantum state can be visualized as a vector with two components. So a single qubit holds two bits of information. And this is cool, but it gets even better. It scales exponentially. This means that if you have two qubits, you can store four bits of information. Eight bits with three qubits and 16 bits with four qubits, etc. Technically, this is a lot of information. Just by way of an example, if you have 300 qubits, you can store more bits of information than there are atoms in the visible universe. Not stars, atoms. I know, I know. Bit of an arbitrary comparison between two things of completely different categories, but it shows what exponential really means. Technically, any operation on those qubits will work on the entire superposition at once. So not only can you store this exponential amount of information, you can also do computations on it at the same time. This is one of the biggest potentials of quantum computers and it's called quantum parallelism. The simplified way people often put this is that quantum computers can do all the calculations at the same time. Now, while this isn't entirely wrong, it's misleading, so I think it's more harmful than useful. Because there is a catch, and we've already talked about that in the qubits video. Whenever you perform a measurement, the state will collapse to just one outcome. So even if all this exponential amount of information is in there, you cannot get it out. And if quantum mechanics is correct, then this limitation is fundamental, meaning we can't and never will. On the face of it, this makes quantum computation seem rather useless. And um, on the face of it, it is. Unless you're very smart about it. We spent all of last video talking just about quantum bits, so now it's time to do some actual quantum computation. This is the basic idea of a quantum circuit. You read it from left to right, like a sentence. So you start with a qubit in some initial state, then some operation is performed on this qubit, and then it is left in a different state. This state can then be measured, or it can be used for further operations, etc. etc. Operating on just a single qubit is very limiting, so we also use two qubit gates. An operation between two qubits that performs some binary mathematical function f. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics, any operation on a quantum state must be reversible, so we always have a specific structure for two qubit gates, where both qubits have a particular role. One qubit acts as the trigger qubit, so it only influences what the function does, but is itself not affected. The second or target qubit is changed and then exits with a modified state that depends on the function and the trigger qubit. Remember though that when you measure the qubits at the end of this, you'll still only get zero or one for each, at random with certain probabilities, and all information previously stored in the state will be lost. That's the big limitation of measurement. Anyway, with these basic building blocks, you can then construct more complex operations, which have several trigger and or target qubits. And you can build much more complicated circuits like these. Now, let's go through an example to see how all of this works. We'll use a very basic example, which is called Deutsch's algorithm, after David Deutsch, who came up with it in the 80s. For starters, there is an unknown function f that is either constant, so it gives identical output for different inputs. We'll call these cases a and b. 
or it is balanced so it gives different outputs for different inputs. We'll call these cases C and D. And the stated problem to solve is this. You have to find out which of both is the case, so whether f is constant or balanced. To solve this classically, we'd have to run the function once on an input of 0 and once on an input of 1. And then we could directly tell whether it's case a, b, c or d. And note that the function itself doesn't have to do anything with quantum stuff. It's just that we can construct a quantum circuit which efficiently solves the problem. For this, we construct a two-qubit operation uf that uses qubit 1 as trigger and qubit 2 as target. And its effect on qubit 2 is to add the value of the function for the trigger qubit onto the target qubit. Now, if you think all of this sounds very contrived, that's because it is. But stick with me. There will be important general points we can learn, even from this forced example. We start with initializing our qubits to 0 and 1, and running both through a so-called Hadamard gate, which changes the state vectors to an equal superposition of 0 and 1, like this. We do this so that we can run the function on both 0 and 1 in one go. What happens to the state vectors in a UF gate depends on what f does, so let's look at what happens in all cases a to d. After doing the math, we find the following results. In case a, nothing changes. In case b, qubit 1 is rotated by 180 degrees. In case c, qubit 1 is rotated by minus 90 degrees. And in case d, by plus 90 degrees. If we were to simply measure the qubits now, we would find any combination of 0 and 1 with equal probability, so we would gain nothing. So we have to be smarter than that. We can see the following. In cases where the function f is constant, the two qubits form a right angle, while in all cases where f is balanced, they are parallel. This is of course no coincidence, the algorithm has been carefully constructed to give exactly this result. And we can directly measure which of those two alternatives applies, with just a single measurement. Basically, it's just applying another Hadamard transform to qubit 1 and then measurement of this qubit in C basis. But these are just mathematical details. The important thing is that there is a way to do it. We can find out whether the function is constant or balanced by measuring just a single qubit, which is superior to the classical methods. All right, let's try to understand uh, why this works and what this means. Everything we did from which states the qubits are initially in, the Hadamard transforms, the exact construction of UF, number and role of qubits, everything was carefully designed to solve the problem at hand. And none of this was obvious or logical, so it probably felt more like a magic trick to you. Also note that in the end it wasn't really about which particular state the qubits are in or which particular output the function would generate. It was all about a property of the states, whether the state vectors were perpendicular or parallel. It wasn't about the states themselves, but about the angle between the two states, which we call the phase. So arguably, the algorithm wasn't so much about getting particular information out of the state, but more like finding meta-information about the states. And it was designed in a way that this information would solve the problem. That is one general possibility to beat the random measuring limitation. You have to transform the states into particular sets with distinct properties that you can use to get information. The other possibility is to construct an algorithm that increases the probability of certain states and decreases the probability of unwanted states. Now, obviously, these two things are very hard to do, so that's why there's such a small number of known quantum algorithms. Well, there is a good number of them, but 
most of them are just simple combinations and variations of just a few basic ideas. Finally, what are the applications of Deutsch's algorithm? Well, really there are none. But it was one of the first algorithms that showed there are cases where quantum computers can outperform classical computers. An exciting result that was highly non-obvious. If you've heard of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage before, that's exactly what it means. And we have since found algorithms with practical applications like breaking encryption or searching a database. And um, that's also the reason why quantum computers don't generally outperform classical computers, but only for very specific cases. Only for those cases where we can come up with an efficient quantum algorithm. While quantum parallelism is pretty neat for computing, there is always the hindrance that measuring qubits will only ever give you one of those many numbers, and a random one on top of that. So. To be successful, quantum computing always has to fight some fundamental properties of quantum mechanics. Or rather, find a sneaky way around them. Showing that this is possible was a very significant achievement, and it's the reason why quantum computing became a thing in the first place.